if you're looking to become like extremely wealthy, then art is not the thing for you. My name is Michael Soy. You're watching Singleton Stories with Biko Zulu. Very normal. I uh, grew up in a, what was back then referred to as middle class Nairobi. Uh, Buruburu, all shiny, very nice picket fences, nice neighbors, a dog here and there, you know, kind of situation. And um, uh, we would hear stories. I mean, I, I grew up around an artist myself. My dad is a painter and, uh, you know, the occasional newspaper photograph and article about him, about his practice, about how he's such a nice artist and that kind of thing. So. I think for me, initially, thinking of wanting to become better than him and uh, wanting to travel to as many countries more than him and, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, it was a mixture of things, but I mean, at the end of it all, you know, by the time I got to, like, I think my second year in high school, I had already made up my mind that I was, this is something that I needed to pursue professionally and this was literally the only thing I wanted to do. People who inspired me like really early on, uh, I mentioned Paul Kilemba Mado, who was like uh, doing cartoons every single day on uh, on the Daily Nation back then. And, you know, we would look at it and uh, we had a club, a, a very small club of like five people who would like, you know, we would get the damn thing and cut it and place it on a wall and then we would try and replicate what he did. This comes up like, I mean, like really early on when you like, you know, when you decide to get into the arts, uh, you're not getting into the arts to become like everybody else. You need to like stand out. You need to be different. You need to tell stories that nobody's telling. Uh, my earlier works, maybe probably, I think around 1997, 98, 99 to 2000, was basically work that I did that revolved around corruption. So for me, corruption, bad governance, and um, a lot of the characters that I used in this kind of work were actually two animal characters, a pig and a cat. And, uh, you know, the pig uh, would represent the gluttony that exists in Kenyan society when it comes, I mean, especially the political class. The cats would uh, represent selfishness. And, uh, you know, a cat only interacts with you when it's hungry. You know, it would come and walk around your legs to make sure that you know that it's there. You feed it, it goes and lies on a couch and that's it until the next time it's hungry. I, I, I did this for like a period of like a, a few years. I mean, two, three years. And then I felt like, ah, okay, I have had enough of this. Let me move on to something else. So this is when I started now introducing um, human characters in my work. And then also uh, the content of the work itself was also shifting from that particular point. I was moving away from politics and getting into social issues. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, it completely shifted into human form now. And then this is where I decided to tell different stories now. Commercial sex, um, intergenerational sex relationship, inter interracial relationships, nothing personal or against whatever. You are allowed to marry whoever you want, be with whoever you want. But I mean, for me, I had a particular kind of like interest in it because whether people like it or not, there's an aspect that I usually like see a lot in this kind of uh, situation that I want to refer to as the economics of love. You know, it's a very one-sided kind of like, you know. So these are the things that I'm looking at. And, you know, uh, whenever I have my exhibitions in a place like Mombasa, a lot of the local guys want to ban my work. And, you know, it's one of these situations that you like, uh, try and become as different as possible from everybody else um, and just try and tell your story as well. Now, uh, I know where the question is headed, but I mean, this is a character I created in my work and uh, you know, it, it's very difficult for me to convince people that because, you know, when you keep on bombarding people with the same image through and through, people begin to kind of like, you know, come up with plans and ideas about what they think that image represents. These are basically fictional characters created in my head to kind of like, you know, uh, what I did is that when I was moving from the animal characters into the human characters, I had to create the characters. 
So I made two characters. One is a man, one is a lady. And unfortunately, the lady is more dominant than the man in my work. Yeah. Commercial sex work is a big, 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 big industry in this country. And a lot of people have no clue that it even exists. Uh, take an example, like walk into the streets of Nairobi and stop any random person you encounter in the street and ask them if they know anybody who does interaction uh, with, uh, with, with commercial sex workers, who, some people who go to strip clubs, people who like, you know. And everybody will tell you that they have no clue. But the question is, who is doing these things? And how is this kind of like, you know, trade kind of like, you know, flourishing in this society? Uh, the answer, like I keep on saying, is very disturbing because the people who go to these places are all our male relatives, our uncles, our dads, our brothers, our male colleagues, and you know. Um, the reason why I took an interest in this kind of like trade was because of the simple fact that um, there seems to be a lot of ignorance that exists in this society about who engages in this kind of trade. So for me, what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to kind of like, you know, um, go to these places where you know not every other kenyan has access to and get the information and put it on canvas and uh let the general public know that this is what goes on this is what happens and this is how it happens we had an exhibition uh as an artist uh exhibition that i have with an artist called tomo gonga the exhibition is basically called sex and the city so basically what happens is uh, it's an exhibition where we walk around and sit around in all these clubs in Nairobi. Um, and the whole idea behind it is to uh, tell stories about the Nairobi nightlife. When we eventually had the exhibition that, uh, at the Lyons Francaise, my dad basically thought that, uh, yeah, you know, let me go and see what he does. It was interesting because I was told that when he walked into the room, he actually just spent one minute and walked out because, you know, he could not stand what he saw, you know. Um, you know, African gentlemen of a certain age, uh, and how they kind of like you know react on issues that revolve around nudity and sex. Uh, totally not his thing, and so he walked away. And you know, I had to have a conversation with my mother about it because me and my mother are very, very. Are very close and uh, you know like yeah so i heard you're doing pornography nowadays I'm like no it's not pornography you have to look at it from uh you know it's uh it is stories being told and you know this is uh part of what um you will get when you go into certain places of nairobi at night yeah the process basically involved uh, stretching canvas and putting it on a wall and looking at it and start seeing things. Uh, when you start seeing things, this could be, it's, a, it's a process that might take like three days, at times four days, at times you go for a week without seeing anything on the canvas. But when it comes, yeah, make your sketch and do your painting and you know, do it for whatever time it takes to like finish. It's a really straightforward kind of like a process to any other uh, creative person who's involved in the visual arts. this misconception out there about you know you you look at uh, at at creative people especially musicians and painters and people kind of like you know get the impression that uh just wake up in the morning and uh, you know you have alcohol for breakfast and smoke a joint and you know like play a guitar and or go and make a few lines on your canvas and this is the kind of thing that people see when now uh, you know, the good part of it and, you know, or what is perceived to be the good part of it. But I mean, at the end of it all, uh, it's a very difficult process. A lot of people who I know who went to art school together, who got into the arts in with, basically have given up and have gone to pursue other interests in, uh, in other kind of sectors. And, you know, um, it's difficult. Um, it took me like a lot of years before I could actually like, you know, now come to a point where I felt like I could have... Uh, Sticking a balance between making money and making my art. So you have to kind of like, you know, get to a point where you need to have alternative sources of income to make sure that you address all these other things that basically now create a situation for you where you are happy to walk into the space and create your work. 
But uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't believe in giving up like really easily. And uh, you know, I decided, you know what, I'll give it one more year. And then after one year, you give it one more year. And then you keep on, you realize you're just giving it one more year. I could have done a lot of things, you know, but uh, I just wanted to kind of like, you know, like really make sure that this didn't work before I give up and move. Uh, decide to pursue other things and you know i mean i think at some point it just like began to get a little easy and you know uh but yeah one thing that i mean i really would like to emphasize when it comes to the arts and you know when people look at people and you decide that this person is doing so well this guy is so lucky trust me this has nothing to do with luck. this has a lot to do with hard work sweat and blood Um, my, 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 my dad never, never thought that I could hack it as an artist, you know. He actually thought I was weak. I was, uh, like I, I told you, I was the black family. I mean, the, bl the black sheep in the family. And, uh, I didn't get a lot of interaction with him. I mean, not any meaningful kind of like interaction, but I mean, at the end of it all, um, he had exposed me to what he did. And this is something that I really wanted to do. And, uh. I kind of like, you know, felt like he thought that if I decided to become a painter, I would like become a failure. This is what motivated me. And, you know, him wanting me to like go join the military or that kind of thing, you know, it was not my thing. So I've just decided that this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to pursue. And this is where I'm going to succeed. Yeah. If you're like, uh, if you're looking to become like extremely wealthy, then art is not the thing for you. If you look at the history of art and, you know, when you look, uh, start looking at people like uh, Vincent van Gogh and, you know, how he basically, like, died a poor man. And, you know, what his work is worth right now. Um, art is, uh, is not something that you should basically walk into lightly, you know, because, uh, to be honest, I mean, if I, like, speak on my own behalf, I mean, what I've been through. Uh, it took me a while to kind of like, you know, really get to a point where I, I had to strike a balance about, you you know, um, become a painter or quitting and becoming something else. But I was determined. I, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. So, I mean, I basically like, you know, had to come up with a way of kind of like, you know, making a few coins in there to take care of the rent, to like take care of the bills and put... Uh, a young kid that uh, to school and that kind of thing. So what I did is that I went into merchandising. I started making small little products that would basically like, you know, supplement the income that I got from the studio itself. And uh, over the years, it basically snowballed into something big. Uh, you know, uh, anybody who knows me knows about the bags that I make um, that are literally uh, not bags to be carried around. These bags are pieces of art in themselves. And the idea that I had um, when starting to create this body of work was that I mean, people would just get it, frame it, and put it on a wall. Um, making like uh, 10 bags in a month uh, until, you know, until Lupita came in, bought a bag, shared it on her socials, and then I went from making 10 bags in a month to like 10 bags in a day. And over time now, after the image went up, <sighs> for seven straight months I didn't do anything else but make mugs to kind of like you know feed that market until I realized this is not who I am I mean I don't want to kind of like you know spend my whole life making commercial things to make money out of so I just decided to cut it down and go back to my studio with all the money that I had made I had a year or two to basically just like go into my space and do my thing without having to think about money and markets. Uh, this is when I realized that I needed to kind of like, you know, um, balance the two because, uh, yeah, well, these were supplementing these and that occasionally these would supplement them. So it was a very good place to be because now I had managed to strike that balance. Um, it's worked out for me. I am very happy right now. I think my struggle is to like really get to a point where you try to reach a totally wide audience. I don't want to consider myself as a village artist anymore. I mean, I think we have gotten to a point where 
we've done things out there and you know uh, but I mean, also like looking at it from a perspective where, I mean, especially right now with this whole COVID thing, it's very difficult to travel and, you know, um, physical spaces. Uh, you talk about galleries. I mean, uh, I will do an exhibition in a place like, uh, let's say, New York. And do the people in New York understand my work? Uh, most of the times the answer is no, you know. Uh, their concept of public transport is not my tattoos and you know so what do i do you get to a point where you also like begin to now kind of like you know address issues that they could understand so audiences my challenge is always audiences i don't want to kind of like you know keep on addressing the same kind of audience all the time you know you have to like also like evolve and you know try and reach as many people as possible A lot, um, but also again for me, what I do is not fiction. I will sit in a space, I will look at people, I will look at what they are doing and that is what I will document. I am basically like uh, holding a mirror to society and people look at the mirror and they don't like what they see so they go after the guy holding the mirror. That is the kind of thing. But I mean, uh, to be honest with you, um, I also try not to kind of like, you know, get like really engrossed in my work. I have collected his work. Um, I don't know, maybe probably like, uh, I'm one of these people who view art as a form of investment. I'm pretty sure right now his work is, uh, is work X. Uh, maybe probably 20 years from today, gonna be worthwhile you know for some funny reason i mean people seem to appreciate our work more when you're dead so maybe probably my daughter or whatever i can you know brag about having the largest collection of african art because i mean what i've done is uh i have collected a lot of artists who actually like happen to be in the same generation as my dad most of them are like extremely famous artists right now locally uh you know the jack katarika is the sunny wadus the you know, all these big, huge names. And, uh, you know, uh, by collecting, I mean buying their work um, where you can. Because also, like, uh, if I want to get, uh, let's say, a work from my friend Jim Nakimani, I can just go and exchange and do a swap with him and get his piece and give you, you understand? But, I mean, there's very limited things you can do with a given thing. So, for me, what I try to do is I try to buy the work and, like, you know, just put it in a room somewhere and forget about it. Uh, that one day I might decide to go to bed and wake up and not be able to paint. <laughs> it's, I mean, it looks like something like really far-fetched, but things happen, you know. Yeah, you, you might get in an accident and lose an arm and, you know, kind of thing. So, I don't know. I mean, I'm just happy with what I'm doing right now and I want to do it for as long as it takes. No, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's not misery per se, it's more of uh, people in struggles and, you know, uh, people who basically like, uh, I am documenting certain moments in people's lives and uh, to be honest with you, uh, the space above the deathbed has to be blank. I have told my story, I have left uh, so much reference in the world to a point where yeah, let me just go in peace and you know, it has to be blank. Yeah. Neat. Because um, if I want to drink water, I'll go and drink water. If I want to drink whiskey, I'll drink whiskey. It's as simple as that.